Joy's going to bring God's word to us. So our reading today is from Ruth chapter 2. And at the beginning it says, Ruth meets Boaz in the grain field. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. And don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me? a foreigner. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose mighty wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she'd eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she'd been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Thank you, Joy. Let's uh, just pray. Father, as we look at your word now, I just pray that, uh, Father, the words that come from me will be your words, you will open our hearts and minds to hear what you want to say to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So today is our uh, harvest service. Now, when I was uh, young, many years ago, and that's hard to imagine, um, uh, I'm sure, but each year at our church, we'd have this massive uh, harvest display, fresh fruit, vegetables. We had a, uh, a big harvest loaf. Do you remember those loaves that bakers made? They looked like a sheaf of wheat. Uh, if you've not seen them, go and Google them. You'll see a picture on them. And uh, a team of people, mostly ladies, but there were the guys did the humping of the tables and the big stuff, and the ladies did all the wonderful decorating. And they would set up uh, the platform in our church, the stage, if you like, uh, with these tables, and they cover them with that kind of green fake uh, grass. You know the stuff that green grocers use to stretch out on their stalls or it's in the market? And then there's fresh fruit and vegetables. We had a lot of people in our church who um, had gardens. Uh, we also had a guy in our church who owned a, a nursery, as in flowers and fruit, that kind of nursery, not, not kids. And uh, we used to set the stage up and it was just beautiful. And you'd come in then on the Sunday morning and there was this smell of fresh fruit and bread. I mean, it was just divine. You, ha you could have to be there to, um, to imagine it. And then as kids and, and the adults as well, we then bring up non-perishable items of food like these uh, during the service, just as we did. Um, and it was, just, it was just a divine sort of smell all the way through the service of this fresh fruit. It kind of made you feel hungry, you know, and uh, just beautiful. And we had a harvest. Sometimes we had a guest speaker come and do our harvest service. We used to have a Christian ventriloquist that used to come to our church. That was a that was amazing, amazing guy. And, uh, and then in the evening, because we, <clears throat> we did church uh, back then uh, twice on a Sunday, we were, we were, um, we were hardcore. Um, and then after the Sunday evening service, they'd then dismantle the stage, and all the fruit and veg uh, would, would be given out to, to different people uh, in the church and fellowship, and all the non-perishable stuff was stored in a, a cupboard in the back uh, hall of the church, ready for Christmas. And at Christmas, we would go carol singing uh, around the district to the homes of the elderly, and we'd give them a, a food hamper um, to, to bless them, and we bless them with carols. If well, if we could sing in tune, it would have been a blessing. Um, and, and it was just a fantastic time. It was an annual event every year that Harvest um, was, was, was celebrated. And uh, then, of course, we remembered the Harvest as we gave out this non-perishable stuff at uh, Christmas. Joy read uh, from the story of, of Ruth. Ruth, <coughs> excuse me, is a wonderful book. If you like love stories and stories of tragedy turning into joy, anybody into those kind of stories? You like those kind of things? I'm just looking for me drink. There it is. Anyone, any like love stories? Yeah, no. Do you like anything? Do you watch anything? Do you listen to anything? I'm always, I'm always puzzled in this church. No, Formula One. Yeah, well, absolutely. That's, that's better than. That's right. I'm just. I, 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 no one ever. Let, you don't just sit at home reading your Bibles 24/7, do you? Oh dear. <laughs> And yeah, the pastor did say, oh dear, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> then you become big fat Christians, don't you see? And then you need to get out there and give out what God has put in, right? Um, so anyway, turn your telly on. You know, it's that little button at the top that says power. Yes. Um, and, uh, and then turn it on and have a look. There's some amazing programs out there that you can watch. Um, sorry, I'm being sarcastic. Um, it's the only kind of humor I've got. Um, but uh, Joy read from Ruth, beautiful love story, tragedy into joy. But there are some important lessons that we can draw from uh, the story of, of Ruth. And if you look back in our uh, sermon uh, library on our website, you'll see we did a whole uh, series on the teaching through the book of Ruth some time ago. And it's through the line of Ruth and Boaz that Jesus is ultimately uh, born. They're part of that story. So let's just break it down. You're like, what's this got to do with harvest? Just, just go with me. You'll see. So Ruth was uh, from Moab. She was a Moabitess. And God had commanded Israel, his people, that they should not intermarry with other uh, nations. The Moabites being one. And if you want to look at the others, go and look at Ezra chapter 9. And there'll be a whole list there of uh, nations that God said, do not intermarry. Do not get involved in their cultures because they were uh, pagan nations. They worshipped other gods. They sacrificed to other gods. And some of their sacrifices were human. And there was, there was a whole lot of stuff. And God's saying, no, I've called you out. You're my people. You're my special people. Don't get involved with those people. So Ruth was from the tribe or the, the, the nation of uh, Moab. Boaz, on the other hand, was an Israelite from the tribe of Judah and the town of Bethlehem. And you'll remember, of course, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. So why was it permissible for Ruth from the tribe of Moab to marry Boaz, an Israelite, when God had said, 
Israelites should not intermarry with these other nations. Well, the key um, can be found uh, in the passage in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16. This is it. But Ruth replied to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. So the backstory to this, if you're not aware of it, is uh, Naomi um, had a husband called Elimelech, and uh, they had two sons, Marlon and Kilion, or Chilion, however you want to pronounce it. And uh, there was a, a famine uh, in Bethlehem in the land they lived, and so um, uh, Ruth, sorry, Naomi's husband Elimelech decided to up the family and move to Moab. There was a problem and a mistake with that to begin with. And whilst they were in Moab, Elimelech dies, and her two sons, Marlon and Kilion, die as well. So Ruth suddenly finds herself as a stranger in this foreign land with no means of provision. Because in those days, the men were the ones that provided uh, for the women. And if your husband died, then your son was supposed to care for you. And if your sons died, you were in a bit of a pickle. Now, the two sons, Marlon and Kilion, had married two Moabite women. One of them was named Ruth and the other was named Orpah. And so there, Naomi decides after her sons have died and her husbands died to return to their homelands. That was the best decision. Ladies, men, we should listen to our wives. They have the best decisions. Yes, you heard me say that right here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, remember that. No, I won't be saying that next week. Um, why, do you know what's happening next week? Oh, okay. I thought you got the vision, a gift of foresight and vision. I was going to use you for that. Okay. Well, yeah, we're at church. So they're, so they're on the road back but for, from Moab, where they've been living, uh, back to Bethlehem. It was the right decision to return to the homeland. And on the way, Naomi says to her daughters-in-law, um, ladies, oh, didn't call them that, I don't think, but ladies, uh, why are you coming with me? Go back to your own people. You might be able to marry again. Naomi says, I'm too old. And even if I found a husband today, and if I conceived today and bore sons, would you wait for them to grow up? And Orpah uh, listens to her mother-in-law and, and, and weeps and, and, and decides to return to Moab. Ruth, on the other hand, stays with Naomi. And this is what Ruth says. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where I go, uh, sorry, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Ruth chooses to follow the Israelite God as she understood it at the time. And we know that foreigners were welcome in Israel, if they came and if they accepted Israel's ways and the faith uh, that Israel had um, in God. If you look back in history in the, in the Old Testament, when you look at Moses bringing the nation of Israel out of Egypt, you remember after they'd been in slavery for 400 years and they come out, lots of other people groups who were in Egypt also uh, came out with Israel. We just think it was the Israelites, but there were other people, including Egyptians, who came out. So Ruth chooses to follow Naomi. She chooses to follow Naomi's God that becomes her God. And God saw that as an honorable act. God saw the fact that Ruth was prepared to lay down, if you like, her heritage as as a Moab, her people. And she was going to follow her mother-in-law back. Despite the fact that she's grieving because her father-in-law's died, her husband's died. She's going to go back with Ruth, uh, sorry, with Naomi to Bethlehem. And she's going to take Naomi's God as her God. That's a massive thing for back then, and probably still is today in some places, for people to switch from, if you like, one religion, if I can put it like that, um, to another. There are often consequences. We know that with some um, beliefs, uh, certainly some of the Muslim beliefs, but also in some of the other denominations like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, uh, when people come over to faith in Jesus Christ, they are cut off sometimes from their family and their friends. It can be a really tough decision to follow after God, and there's a lot of loss. Um, that, that often comes with that from people of other faiths um, and um, um, other nations. So that's something just to bear in mind. So for Ruth, this was a massive deal. And she chose to follow Naomi. God saw that as an honorable act. And he rewards that kindness. God sees what is done and rewards us in different ways. We'll come into that in a minute. And interestingly, this is one occasion where although God has chosen his people, Israel, Ultimately, God's heart was that all nations should come to the family of God. Sometimes people, I think, can look at the, the Old Testament and say, well, God just picked Israel. You know, that was a bit kind of favoritism. It's not at all. When you look at, through the Old Testament, you see glimpses of, and then it becomes a little clearer in the New Testament, that God didn't just want 
Israel, just didn't want the Jews for himself. He wanted all people uh, to come to himself. And as I say, in the New Testament, um, we know that salvation wasn't just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And Ruth, although she was a mobile test, would have been under that umbrella of being classed as a Gentile, just as you and I, if we're not Jewish, we would be classed as Gentiles. The Christian family is multicultural. Just look around you. It's multicultural. This church is multicultural. My current master's uh, degree unit I'm doing now is on multicultural uh, churches. Um, it's fantastic. I've got to write a 6,000-word essay on a multicultural church. It's, this is going to be easy, right? Well, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> but in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, this is what John, who had this vision of heaven, this is what he said. John said, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number, now listen to this, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, that's Jesus, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. That is a picture of the church. So in the Old Testament, God had his people Israel. Other people could come and join Israel and accept um, God as their God, reject uh, their other gods of wood and stone and everything else. They were welcomed in. And then as we see it into the New Testament, we know on the day of Pentecost, um, 3,000 people are added to their number. And the gospel spreads uh, through the apostles to the Gentiles and across the world. Um, and so it's gone from these these this nation, the Jewish people, to now um, the, the whole world. God has a, uh, a plan. He has a family of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, and we are part of that family. Isn't that good news? So God's favor means that Ruth catches the eye of Boaz. Okay, so love story, here we come. Okay, God's favor means that Ruth catches the eye of Boaz. And if you're married here, or if you have been married here, then you'll know that at some point, you caught the eye of the person uh, that you were going to marry. Anyone remember those days? John, do you remember those days when you saw Wendy? And you just... Just like yesterday. Just like yesterday. Absolutely. Good answer, mate. I've been teaching him well. Do you remember those days? <laughs> and Harvey, do you remember when you saw Eileen? And, and, and Bart, you remember you saw Steph? And you're like, whoa, that's amazing, you know, which is beautiful. <laughs> And I saw Joy in Patchwork, Dungarees, and I was like, she's the girl for me. Um, the faith bit was an added bonus, but the, no, um, the faith bit was central. So, right, we, we, um, we, we, we grew, sort of grew up together through, you know our story anyway. Um, so, so Ruth catches the eye of, of Boaz, this farmer, and she goes to glean in the field. And, uh, and, and Boaz instructs his men, okay, his servants, if you like, his people, his uh, farm hands who were gathering in the wheat because they didn't have combine harvesters in those days. They did it all by hand. And he instructs the men to let Ruth glean. Well, why was that? Was it just that it was actually he was being nice? No, actually, it was uh, in the Bible, Leviticus chapter 19, uh, verses 9 and 10, uh, said this. When you reap the harvest of your land, this is God's instruction to Israel. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. Nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. That's gleanings being the bits that they've missed that have dropped on the floor, okay? Or that the scythe didn't cut through, those bits that's just sticking up, right? Don't do that. Verse 10, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. At this point in the story, Ruth is a stranger to Boaz. Boaz has seen her. Attractive girl here in my field. That's probably what he thought. Um, and he instructs, along with the basis of what God had instructed Israel, to leave parts of the field for her to glean. Ruth was a stranger in the land. She was poor at this time. And he just follows what God has commanded him to do. And actually, he then goes on because Ruth is really caught. Maybe she took her headdress off and she saw her flowing hair. I don't know what she looked like. Um, but you just got to imagine, right? And he, Boaz sees her and, and there's something that is even greater stirred in his heart. And he says in Ruth chapter 2, 16, he says to his men, Also, let grain for, from the bundles fall purposefully for her. Leave it so that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So not only could Ruth gather from the edges of the field, the corners of the field, and the bits that had accidentally been fallen, but the farm hands were deliberately leaving stuff for Ruth uh, to glean. So here we see Boaz extending this arm of provision to the poor in accordance with what God had instructed. 
So Naomi's husband and sons should have been the providers because she was destitute. She returns to the land with Ruth. Ruth goes out and gleans in the field through hard work and hard labor. Boaz sees this, and Boaz's kindness and God's matchmaking behind the scenes. Yes, God does matchmaking uh, behind the scenes. We see this tragic story turn into a joyous story of hope with the marriage, ultimately, of Boaz and Ruth and the son that is then born to them. And eventually, Jesus, the Savior of the world, born through that family line. God has a plan in all things. And if you're sitting there and there's something going on in your life and going, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's next. God has a plan. Trust in that. God has a plan. He welcomes the foreigner, as they were referred to then, into his family. He blesses those who honor him. He calls his people to care for and provide for the poor. Through those acts of kindness, God's kingdom is extended and his people are blessed, right? And his people is you today. And people in Milton Keynes Christian Center down the road and at New Life and at St. Mary's and the black African churches that meet in this building. We're all part of God's people today. And the instruction that God gave to the poor, to, sorry, to his people back then to support and help the poor and provide food for the poor is exactly what we are called to do today. Out of Boaz's kindness and generosity comes a son whose name was, anyone know? You want to get it wrong, do you? Obed. There you go. Obed. And from Obed came Jesse. Jesse. Yes. Top marks. Top of the class. And from Jesse came David. David. There you go. You're catching it. King of Israel. On whose throne Jesus will sit. Luke chapter 132 tells us that. Out of Boaz's wheat harvest ultimately comes a harvest of souls through Jesus Christ. When Boaz saw Ruth, this beautiful woman, gleaning and thought, she's the woman for me, he had no idea about how exactly it would fully work out. A harvest of grain stalks lying on the ground or in the corner of the field ultimately leads to a harvest of souls through Jesus Christ. Who knows where our kindness and our generosity will lead, what outcome it will manifest. Who knows that this food that we have given here, who knows what God will use that for and turn that into, right? We've already heard from Chimwe what happens when God works miracles. I want to see God work miracles with this, don't you? Yeah, yeah. amen, absolutely. The kindness of those giving to that harvest offering when I was a child all those years ago meant that come December, we could bless old folk with a gift of food and some carol singing. There was this, this house that we went to. We, we lived in Kent, right? Right in the, you know, the town of Dover, Deal, the southeast corner. And we would go out, and there was this particular house. And I, it, it moves me even today. I can't get it out of my head, this, this, this house. It was in the middle of uh, Fiume like Nowhere. I think it was on a crossroads. And there were just fields around it. It was a single house, a cottage. And there were lots of trees around it. The garden was fairly unkempt. And I don't know how we knew, but there was a lady living there. And she didn't have electricity. Uh, she... she uh, lit her home through oil lamps. Maybe she had a gas fire or something, but oil lamps um, and, and candles. That, that was it. And as a, as a child, we had electricity at home and stuff. And I was just, I don't, there was just something about this situation, this woman, this woman's, I was going to say poverty. Maybe she, maybe she chose to live like, maybe she wasn't poor. I don't know. But there was something about it that every year I used to talk to whoever was leading the carol singing and saying, are we going to see this particular lady? Because there was just something about her situation that resonated uh, in my heart as a child. I don't know what it was, but there was just so something that God had put there. I, I don't know, and I, I doubt whether she's still alive now. I don't even know if the house is still there. Um, we'll have to go ne and look next time we're down in Kent. But there was something that moved that. And through that generosity in the harvest service as a child, old folk were blessed with gifts of food and the singing of carols, a little bit of joy uh, in that season. The kindness of our life groups in years past has meant that struggling families that we have connected with through the likes of Acorns have been given hampers of food and presents for their children. Did you know that? The kindness of folk here at Shenley Christian Fellowship means that many people over the years have been blessed by financial and practical gifts paid for through the family fund. You should all know what, unless you're visiting, you should know what the family fund is because we put it in our um, pastor's pen every month. 
The kindness of this church has meant that over the years, the Win MK Winter Night Shelter Project has been able to use this building and homeless people have come and they've been warm and they've been fed and they sleep cosily in here because we have underfloor heating and they love it. Um, because of our generosity and people who are no longer with us through the building of this building over the years. When we give to God, he uses it to bless others and us in some way at some time. We'll find that there is a reward that comes back to us either in this lifetime or in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 and it says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. They're Jesus' words. God may give back to us in this world, in this life. I remember years ago when I was at, we were at Bible college and uh, we moved there in faith and we lived on, it was about 300 pound a month, 300 pound a month. <laughs> Yeah, we laughed too. And, um, and it was it's sort of like, how the heck do you make three? Mind you, this was in 2001 where things were a little bit cheaper. But still, three, you know, there was a family of four. We had Joel was, I um, don't know how old Joel was. Were you 18 months, two years or something? And then David came along as well. And we were living by faith. And uh, we continued to tithe in that time because God said, well, tithe. He didn't say, if you go to Bible college, stop. So we continued uh, to give, and God provided for us. And I remember one day, uh, my laptop, which I bought, that actually wasn't that old. It wasn't a Mac. I hadn't seen the light at those times. Um, I, I bought it, and uh, I was uh, working away. And then it, it just gave up. It just stopped. It broke. It turned off. It, just, it was dead as a dodo. And all my college work was on there. Um, and I, I remembered people talked about getting on your knees and praying. Uh, those times it was easier. I had two legs. And I got down on my knees in the lounge, um, and I prayed and I said, God, I need, I need a computer. I can't do my essays or my work is on the computer. can't do it. And it was either later in, in, on, on that evening or next day or two, we had a phone call from a, a friend of Joy's. I don't know whether I've met her this time. And she said, my dad runs this Christian charity and he likes to give from that charity, a bit like tithing, right? Um, and he wants to give you a gift of, I don't know how much it was. But whatever it was, it was enough to have a, um, my pastor at the time, who also built computers, to build us a computer. And he managed to rescue the work that was lost on my uh, laptop. He took the hard drive out um, and did it. So sometimes we find that when we have problems, if we're faithful and give to God, even in the tough times, and we think we've got no way of sorting something, God provides in ways we never thought was possible. We never thought we'd see it. We, never, we, we feel completely lost. Things are beyond us. We lift it to God in, in prayer on our knees, and God answers back. Amen? So there is, we're coming to an end now, there is a call to give. Okay, Kadian spoke a couple of weeks about giving, um, not exclusively financially, but that was quite a big thrust because the giving in the church has gone down a bit, and obviously we, there's certain things we need to pay for and uh, deal with as well. We have responsibilities, so he was teaching on that. But this is a call from our Heavenly Father, a call to give that was modeled through the life of Jesus and ultimately the giving of Jesus' own life for the hearts of mankind. We give sacrificially now because J Jesus gave sacrificially in the form of his life uh, on the cross. It's not just a call to give to the church with money. It's not just that. If we think it's that, that's not, that's not it. Um, it's not just to give to the church with our time and our abilities. We need to have a grander vision of giving, a bigger vision, a bigger heart of giving to other people, giving out into the world. The treasure that Jesus has given to us is a call just not to hold on to ourselves, but to bless other people, which we have done through our ministry, the likes of Acorns, through the food bank, through the winter night shelter. And there's so many other things we can do, but we're only a church of a certain size. And so we're limited to how much we can do, but we want to keep giving out with that heart that Jesus had to give his life for the ransom of many, we want to give what God has given us for other people. We need that grander vision so that it's part of our hearts, our love and compassion. It's part of the church DNA, if you like. It should be a lifestyle that is birthed in each one of us through our salvation. Knowing that what we've been saved from, we want to see others saved. Our role might be to bring them to faith in Christ. But it might also just be a step along the road to come to faith. 
we've not, I, I think I'm fairly, Jim will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we've seen 50 people come through the doors on a food and clothing bank night and fall on their knees and give their hearts to Jesus. But what we have seen is people this uh, past Friday, 57 families come through the door to take food and to take clothes that they've needed. That may just be the step that they need. Someone else may share the gospel and they come to faith, but they will remember the good things that this church has done and invested in their life. It's not just about reaping, it's about sowing as well. And if you're like me, I think, Lord, sometimes all we do is sow, 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 and we don't see many reaping. Um, maybe you pray like that as well. We need to pray that we will see uh, reaping as well. Amen? Where did I go to my screen jumps? Oh, there we go. Right. 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and 11 says this. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. Okay, to close. We've talked about harvest. We've talked about giving generously from a heart of love and compassion, as we see demonstrated in both the lives of Ruth, giving her life to Naomi, and Boaz giving his harvest and ultimately his love to Ruth. And so I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you personally, okay? Whether you're watching online, whether you're here, I'm challenging you. So if you've gone to sleep, wake up. This is the challenge for you this morning. Sorry, did that make you jump? <laughs> Serves you right falling asleep. Um, I want to ask you a question. Because for a harvest to happen, there has to be a sowing of seed, right? Okay. In agriculture, where there is a harvest is obvious, right? Because you see a huge dusty... Uh, combine harvest, I'm talking about wheat, wheat harvest here, uh, dusty machine rumbling up and down the fields with a tractor next to it and all the grain pouring out. It's visible. You see it. You hear it. You may not notice the smaller tractor in the autumn pulling a seed drill. You don't see the seed, do you, until it becomes obvious in the spring. So the challenge is this. What has God been sowing into your life that people may not have seen or you may not actually have noticed, but is now ripe for harvest. What gifts, what abilities, what talents has God sowed into your life that have grown gradually and you now need to harvest, i.e. you need to use and develop that which God is calling and saying, I've put this into you. Maybe you know it's there, maybe you didn't know it was there. Sometimes people say to us, I really see you as... X, or I really think God has given you the gift of X. God has put that in you. You may never have noticed it. You may have seen those things that God has given you. Now could be the time to reap that harvest, that thing that God has put in you. I'm not telling you this now is the time. I'm saying go and ask God and say, is now the time to, to reap that? And then think about this. When that harvest is gathered in, when the combine's rumbled up and down and thresh the wheat inside it and all the grain pours out into the tractor and the tractor takes it to the farm and ultimately the factories. That, that's not the end of it, right? It still needs working on to retrieve the flour that's in the grain for the grain to be put to use to make the bread or whatever it's going to be made into. So what gifts has God been instilling in you that now need to be harvested and worked on to see the end product? People might say, I think you've got the gift of X. Okay, well, if you believe that and you think God's telling you that, come and talk to the leadership team. Come and talk to me. Let's see if there's an area where you can put that into use. It may not be the finished product. It likely isn't the finished product. But we've got to fan it into flame. We've got to make it visible. We've got to help you grow in what God has put in you. That thing he's been sowing and sowing and sowing into you. And he's been nurturing in you that you may not have been aware of, you might have been aware of. Now could be the time to harvest that. Maybe those gifts are for the use of in the church and for God's glory. Maybe they are for use in the world for his glory. Maybe they're for both. Ecclesiastes 3, 2b says, there is a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. Your mission today, should you choose to accept it? You like that? See what I did there? <laughs> no, it's not going to self-destruct. No, this message won't self-destruct. And Tom Cruise is not coming through that door. Sorry, ladies. Your mission today, should you choose to accept it? is to go and ask your heavenly Father, God, Father, what have you planted in me that you are now telling me it's time <clears throat> to harvest and put to good use? Because remember, that is exactly what God did with Ruth and with Boaz. He was preparing them ahead of time. They had no idea. 
these two people to be ultimately part of the lineage of the Savior, Jesus Christ. What will God use the harvest that comes from your life to achieve for his purposes in his kingdom? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you have poured into us so much. You have provided for us for so many things. Lord, there have been times, I'm sure, for all of us where we've gone through times of hardship financially or with other struggles. And then we look back and now we're in a time that's more comfortable. We go, how did that happen? And we see your hand of blessing and provision, sometimes through that phone call, sometimes through an envelope through the front door with money in it. Sometimes just we get a promotion at work or we get a pay rise at work. Sometimes, which really is a miracle, when we get money back from the tax man. Father, we just want to thank you for those things and the other ways you do it. And Father, I pray that today, Lord, whatever you have been sowing into our lives as your people in this church, those who are here, those who are watching, those who can't be with us today, Lord, that you will uh, reveal to each person in their hearts whether now may well be the time to harvest that. That thing that you've been growing, that gift, that talent, that ability, that whatever it is, that now may be the time to bring it forward and say, God, I want you to use this. And then, Father, that you will indeed open up opportunities for people to use those gifts that you are given. Father, Jesus said in his word that the poor will always be with us. Sometimes we pray that we'll eradicate poverty. We will never do that, folks, because Jesus said the poor will always be with you. But Jesus also demonstrated through his life through stories like the story of Ruth and Boaz and other places in Scripture where we can give to the poor. We can give to those in need. We can extend God's hand of love and provision to them. So, Father, open up opportunities for us to do that this week. Lord, help us not to judge, not to work out whether it's we should or shouldn't give to that person we see sitting on a street corner, but you will fill our hearts with compassion for those that do not have. And then, Father, out of our wealth and comfort, you will show us how to give to those who have not, to bless them. And to you create opportunities for us to share, not just here's a gift of food, here's a gift of money, here's whatever, but opportunities to share our faith, the story of you with those people as well, we pray. Lord, build your kingdom in this world, and we say, come, Lord Jesus, and take your church home in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this morning's service. It's been great to have you with us. I just wanted to very briefly share with you how you can give your heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. I became a Christian when I was eight years old at a kid's summer holiday club. And it was an amazing time. And I remember praying a very simple prayer and I remember the feeling in my heart, in my life, that I just had that feeling inside of me. Something changed when Jesus came into my life. And the great thing is that when we do it, when we ask Jesus into our life, he doesn't just add it onto his to-do list. It happens straight away, straight away. And it's just, it's, it's the best decision we could make in life. You can change the trajectory of your life when you ask him in. And when he comes in, he comes in to, to be your friend, to be your Lord, to be your savior, to be your helper in difficult times. And you know, I've been through some incredibly difficult times in my life, but I know that God has helped me every step of the way. Jesus has been with me every step of the way. And when I've had important decisions to make, I've prayed about them. And Jesus has helped me to make the right decision. When I've gone through tough times, he's comforted me and enabled me to get through those difficult times where otherwise I probably would have taken another course of action, but he's helped me in those times. And so when I was eight years old, I remember praying a very simple prayer, and, and the prayer involved just these few simple sentences. I asked Jesus to forgive me. I admitted that I'd done something wrong. I repented of my sin. And I made that 180 degree turn to start following him. And so if you want to do that this morning, if you want to take that step, then I want to help you pray that prayer. So if you're ready for that now, let's do it now. So just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned. I recognize that I've done my life my way. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. 
I repent of my sin. Please come into my life. I choose right here, right now, to make that 180 degree turn and start following you and living my life the way you would want me to. Please come into my life to be my Lord and Saviour. Amen. And if you've prayed that, then that's then fantastic. I'm so pleased for you that you've changed the trajectory of your life. You have made the most important decision you could make in your entire life. But I want you to do two things for me. The first thing is this. I want you to get in contact with me and let me know that you've prayed that prayer. And the reason is because then we can be accountable to one another. We can support one another. So when you send me an email, the email address will come up at the bottom of the screen. I can get back in touch with you and I can send you some, some information to help you uh, on your journey as a new Christian. The second thing I want you to do is to get into a good church. Now I don't know where you live. If you live in Milton Keynes, you're welcome to come to Shenley Christian Fellowship or there are other great churches in this city that you can be a part of. But if you live at other places in the country, then I want to try and help you find the church to be a part of. It's important that we're part of a church which is welcoming, a church that teaches the Bible, a church that believes in great worship, and also a church that will help you on your journey as a Christian. We call it discipleship, but, but it's basically teaching us how to, how to live our life as a Christian. And so I wanna help you do that if I possibly can. So thank you for being with us this morning. I'm so pleased that you made that step, but if you haven't prayed that prayer and you still need time to think, then I want to encourage you to think it through. And I wanna encourage you to pray and ask Jesus and say, can you help me in making this decision? Because he will do that. And, uh, and we, I just want to bless you this morning. So just take care and stay safe.